For Leonardo da Vinci, Goethe, and Nabokov, art and science were one. They used their artistic knowledge to help them understand natural creativity. For a lot of people today, art and science seem like entirely separate domains. How can art and science interact meaningfully? I work in a very interdisciplinary field called biosemiotics. We study questions like, how does matter become mind and our cells intelligent? These are questions about meaning and creativity. These are essentially questions about art. The art manifesto is a common way for science to influence the arts. Manifestos, like new conventions, often prescribe a way of doing art that fits with some new discovery in science, showing us how we really see or how nature really is, and therefore how artists might represent life according to this new understanding. The interaction most often seems one way, with science influencing the arts, but interaction could go the other way. Biosemiotics is the study of sign use, from cell signaling to human thought. Even organisms that don't have brains use signs in their environment to survive and adapt. Here's final response to airborne signs of food navigating around the barrier. What do I mean by sign? A sign is something that stands for something other than what it materially is. In biology, signs stand for the self-preserving or homeostatic processes they tend to indirectly trigger. Indirectly, that's key. A cell receptor is evolved to respond to a specific type of particle. The cell responds to sign A, which triggers chemical process B inside the cell, which is another sign to trigger process C, and so on, eventually resulting in growth or maintenance. So how does an inanimate chemical reaction become a sign? Only when it leads to a self-reinforcing cycle that allows that chain of reactions to happen again. We can imagine various random reactions between a cell and its environment going on all the time, but if these chains just die without having any positive feedback, then they are just chemical reactions. They are not meaningful responses. The likelihood of these dead-end reactions won't increase as it does in useful reactions. But if another element happens to get caught up that forms a cycle, it becomes a process that makes more of the stuff it needs to make more of the stuff it needs, a semiotic process. Or rather, the beginning of one. A fully semiotic cycle needs to be part of a larger complex system whose parts make and are made by each other and have the potential to evolve. Evolution requires some flexibility. Different parts of this chain of reactions can be indeterminate. A number of things might have been substituted in any one of these steps. It's kind of like a perpetual motion Rube Goldberg machine. It doesn't always matter what the intermediate steps are, as long as the cycle can reset and continue. Of course, it's not entirely arbitrary what can become a new biological sign. First, the material has to be close enough, plentiful enough, to this chain to have the chance of becoming involved. The useful part must be floating around nearby. It has to have some formal property, shape, in order to perform the role. Molecules tend to interact in these signaling sequences if they have puzzle piece-like complementary shapes. So for something to be a sign, it's got to fit, it's got to be nearby, and it's got to be arbitrarily associated with a goal state. Similarity, contiguity, and arbitrarity. That's the basis of semiosis. Biology largely deals with understanding how biological systems currently function, how they go about their automatic routines or conventions, if you will, without external control, other than the design that evolution has programmed in. But how do organisms adapt? How do they break out of their program? If this represents a normal biological process, each part involved would be a particular type of molecule that's always involved in the process. What if a molecule was introduced that was coincidentally similar? It might activate a different kind of useful process. Because a sign is not directly linked to the goal state, it can be repurposed. 
Bacteria can use CAMP as a signal to regulate a hundred different processes depending on environmental conditions. Some scientists tend to visualize signaling processes as gears and wheels. Something can't just float by and become part of the process. The gears are very precisely defined. This is true of computer codes too. Substitutions are not allowed. It is very misleading when scientists use machine and computer metaphors to talk about biology. Organisms are very, very different. They can reconfigure themselves. They are open and adaptive, more like the process of art making, in which substitutions are possible and common. Something can be a sign for something else if it's a metaphor based on an actual physical transformation, or if it's a synecdoche based on an actual part-whole relation. But something can also be a sign for something else if it's a simile based on a mere accidental similarity or metonymy based on a mere accidental contiguity, accidental nearness. But there can be a downside to this flexibility. Some chemicals might fit into a signaling cascade in a dysfunctional way. Assuming a mechanistic view of nature can be dangerous. The pesticide DEET is a famous example. The molecule fits with an enzyme that is needed in neural signaling processes. Semiosis is not just an analogy to imagine how biology works. Organisms are not machines, they are not computers, they are sign users. The artist intuitively understands that the creative process is unpredictable based on the way that signs originate. Nature can never be entirely within our control, and I'd like to suggest that artists should write manifestos for science. And that's one way that science and art can interact meaningfully, by helping us understand how nature creates and how uncontrollable it can be. Please comment, like, and subscribe so you don't miss our next video on Vladimir Nabokov's controversial theory of insect mimicry. Thanks for watching.